April 3rd, 1974. Hours before devastation, the Midwest moves through a normal morning. What no one sees coming is the most explosive collision of wind, heat, and pressure ever captured by forecasters. A 140 mile per hour jet stream, unstable air, a storm so violent it would spin up five tornadoes on radar simultaneously. In just 24 hours, when skies unleashed fury, 148 tornadoes would ravage 13 states, killing over 300 and injuring thousands. How did a single spring day turn neighborhoods into ruins and expose fatal flaws in America's warning systems? The answer begins with a silent shift in the atmosphere, and it spirals rapidly out of control. By sunrise on April 3rd, the atmosphere across the Midwest was already restless. High above, a jet stream tore eastward at nearly 140 miles per hour, one of the fastest ever recorded over the region in spring. At ground level, humid air surged north from the Gulf, colliding with cooler, drier air spilling out of Canada. The result was a volatile mix. Warm, moist instability trapped beneath a lid of cold air, just waiting to be released. Meteorologists tracking the situation in 1974 relied on WSR-57 radar, a technology that offered only grainy, two-dimensional glimpses of approaching storms. Forecasters squinted at green screens, marking storm cells with grease pencils, hoping to spot the telltale hooks that signaled tornado formation. Compared to today's Doppler radar, which can detect rotation inside a thunderstorm miles before a tornado forms, the tools of the era left dangerous gaps. Dr. Frederick Ospie, leading forecast operations at the National Severe Storms Forecast Center, watched the morning data with growing concern. He issued a rare, urgent outlook. Conditions were primed for the kind of tornadoes that could flatten entire towns. His message to the field was simple, be prepared. The jet stream's power, combined with record-setting instability, meant any thunderstorm that formed could spin up into a monster. But for millions of people in the outbreak zone, none of this was visible. Radios played music, schools opened their doors, and the sky, if anything, looked deceptively calm. Beneath that calm, however, the atmosphere was quietly stacking the odds for disaster. The limits of 1974 radar meant that even as the ingredients for catastrophe gathered, warning times would be short and uncertainty high. The stage was set for a day when science would race against nature and fall just short. At exactly 1 p.m. in Morris, Illinois, the first tornado of the day touched down. It tore across fields and neighborhoods, splintering barns and stripping roofs, but left no fatalities in its wake. For the radar operators watching from distant weather service offices, this was the first confirmation that their worst fears might be realized. The screens showed more than just one trouble spot. By mid-afternoon, up to five distinct hook echoes appeared at once. In 1974, a hook echo was the closest thing to a smoking gun a curved signature on a grainy radar display, hinting at violent rotation inside a thunderstorm. One operator later recalled, there were five distinct hook echoes simultaneously, any one of which could have been catastrophic. The pace of warning struggled to keep up. Each hook on the radar could mean a tornado already on the ground, or one about to form. But with only static-filled phones and limited radio relays, the information moved too slowly. By 3.20 p.m., a supercell near DePaul, Indiana, produced the first F5 tornado of the outbreak. The storm cut a path through Harrison County, flattening homes and tossing vehicles like toys. Entire neighborhoods were swept clean off their foundations. Six people lost their lives, and dozens more were injured in a matter of minutes. The DePaul tornado traveled more than 60 miles before finally lifting, leaving a trail of devastation that stunned even seasoned forecasters. For those tracking the outbreak, the realization set in. This was not a typical spring storm. The simultaneous hook echoes on radar screens, the rapid fire formation of tornadoes, and the appearance of an F5 so early in the day all pointed to a disaster still gaining momentum. 
As warnings echoed across police radios and news bulletins, the sense of urgency deepened. The outbreak was no longer a forecast. It was a reality, unfolding faster than the tools of the era could track. At 4.40 p.m., the tornado entered Xenia, Ohio, with winds clocked near 318 miles per hour. In a matter of minutes, entire neighborhoods vanished. John Steiner, sitting in a donut shop on Main Street, watched as trees spun through the air like matchsticks. He later said the world outside looked like it had been erased. Catherine Wilson, a high school student, was home with her mother when the siren sounded. She remembers asking, are those tornadoes? The answer came in a roar that shook the walls. The windows exploded inward. Catherine and her mother barely made it to the basement as their house was torn apart above them. Downtown, the A&W Root Beer Stand was crowded with families finishing early dinners. Dorothy Rowland, a longtime employee, glanced at her friend Betty and started to say, Betty, listen. But the words were swallowed by the storm. The building was flattened in seconds. Survivors would later find Rowland's words echoing in their minds, the last trace of normalcy, before everything changed. The Graham family lived in the Arrowhead subdivision. As the tornado carved its path, a steel beam from the destroyed Crayler furniture plant crashed through their home. Three of the Graham children were killed. Their parents survived, but nothing in the world could explain the randomness of who was taken and who was spared. Across town, Xenia High School's auditorium collapsed just after teachers rushed students into a hallway. A school bus was thrown onto the stage of the local theater, a sight that would become one of the outbreak's most haunting images. The Kroller plant itself was reduced to twisted metal, its debris scattered for miles. By the time the winds died down, half of Xenia was gone. 34 people were dead, more than a thousand injured. President Nixon arrived days later, walking through the ruins and telling reporters, this is the worst devastation I have seen. The words hung in the air, heavy with the weight of everything lost. In Zania, April 3rd would never be just another date again. In Brandenburg, Kentucky, the afternoon of April 3rd brought a silence that felt unnatural. Tom Bridge, making his usual rounds delivering newspapers, glanced at the sky and saw nothing out of the ordinary, until the wind shifted. Moments later, the world began to unravel. As the tornado barreled toward town, Bridge pulled his truck to the side of the road and whispered a prayer. Lord, I didn't know I was coming to heaven in a pickup truck. The roar was deafening. Windows shattered. Houses disintegrated. In less than a minute, entire blocks vanished from the map. David Pace, just 17 at the time, sprinted through the chaos toward City Hall. With the storm bearing down, he forced open the basement door and huddled with a handful of terrified neighbors. Above them, the building groaned and shook as the tornado passed overhead. When Pace climbed the stairs after the winds faded, he stepped into an alien landscape. Familiar streets erased, landmarks replaced by piles of debris and twisted metal. The tornado cut a path straight through Brandenburg, destroying 128 homes and killing 31 people. Survivors wandered in shock, searching for loved ones among the ruins. Steve Strainy, another resident, picked his way through the wreckage, finding fragments of his family's life scattered across fields and yards. The randomness of survival was impossible to make sense of. One house flattened, the next left standing. A photograph from a child's bedroom fluttering in a tree a mile away. Church bells rang in the aftermath, not for celebration, but as signals for rescue crews and volunteers. In the days that followed, Brandenburg's community gathered in makeshift shelters, sharing stories of loss and resolve. The memory of that day would shape the town's future, and for David Pace, it became a call to service. Years later, he would return as mayor, determined to rebuild and honor those who were lost. In Brandenburg, the storm's fury left scars, but it also revealed a quiet strength that would carry the town forward. Tanner, Alabama, faced a disaster no meteorologist had ever recorded before. 
At 6.28 p.m., an F5 tornado carved through the town, tossing homes, splintering trees, and leaving entire neighborhoods in ruins. Survivors crawled from the wreckage and rushed to help the injured, carrying them to the local church, a place they hoped would be safe. Less than 35 minutes later, a second F5 tornado barreled down nearly the same path. The church, now filled with wounded and rescuers, took a direct hit. Some who survived the first tornado lost their lives in the second. The death toll in Tanner climbed to 44 by nightfall, with families torn apart and entire blocks erased. In the midst of the chaos, Alan Lindley, a weather enthusiast, set up a battery-powered cassette recorder in his basement. As the first F5 approached, Lindley's tape captured the sound of the storm, a distant rumble swelling into a roar, glass shattering, timbers snapping, and then the unmistakable freight train thunder of the tornado overhead. For scientists, Lindley's recording remains one of the only real-time audio documents of a violent tornado's approach. Raw, unfiltered evidence of nature's power. Further west, in Gwyn, the Todd family tried to escape by car. The tornado hurled their vehicle 150 feet, tearing it apart. The force of the storm scattered debris and lives across the Alabama countryside. With power lines down and sirens silent, many never knew what was coming until it was too late. The outbreak's southern rampage left a landscape of loss. Houses gone, families broken, and a silence that settled only after the skies finally cleared. In the hours after the tornadoes passed, the chaos gave way to something else. At Green Memorial Hospital in Zania, doctors and nurses worked by flashlight, their hands steady despite the darkness and the flood of injured people arriving from every corner of the city. With the power out and equipment damaged, staff improvised, operating on kitchen tables, using doors pulled from wrecked homes as makeshift stretchers. Volunteers streamed in, some still in shock, carrying blankets, food, and whatever supplies they could find. Outside, the Ohio Air National Guard began arriving before nightfall. In total, more than 7,500 National Guard troops would be deployed across the outbreak zone, not just to Zinnia, but to hard-hit towns from Kentucky to Alabama. Their orders were simple. Secure the streets, search for survivors, and help restore order where entire neighborhoods had vanished. For many, the uniform presence brought a measure of relief, a sign that help was here, even if the scale of the disaster felt impossible to contain. Relief centers sprang up in churches, schools, and parking lots. Local business owners donated food, clothing, and water. Clergy and community leaders organized teams to check on the elderly and deliver medicine. The slogan, Xenia Lives, appeared on hand-painted signs, pinned to telephone poles and taped to broken windows. What began as a rallying cry for those who had lost homes and loved ones quickly became a symbol of determination. In the face of ruin, neighbors became rescuers, strangers became friends, and a battered city found the will to stand together. Across the outbreak zone, this spirit of unity and improvisation became the first step toward recovery. In the wake of the super outbreak, federal officials and engineers faced a clear mandate. The warning systems of 1974 were not enough. The government responded with the largest investment in severe weather detection technology in U.S. history. Over $4.5 billion went into building the NEXRAD Doppler radar network, a nationwide web of more than 120 high-resolution radars. By 1996, every corner of Tornado Alley from rural towns to major cities, had access to real-time storm tracking. Up above, the GEOS satellite program transformed weather monitoring from space. The first advanced sensor launched in 1980, with new generations coming online through the 1990s, giving meteorologists a constant eye on storm development across the continent. On the ground, NOAA Weather Radio grew from just 66 transmitters in 1974 to over 330 by the end of the century, blanketing nearly the entire country with instant alerts. These upgrades weren't just hardware, they changed what was possible. 
Average tornado warning lead times jumped from five minutes to more than 13, and false alarms dropped sharply. For the first time, science and policy combined to give communities a fighting chance against the worst nature could offer. Dr. Ted Fujita arrived in the outbreak zone with a camera, a notebook, and a relentless curiosity. Over the next 10 months, he walked every major damage path, mapped debris fields from the air, and interviewed survivors who had watched their homes vanish in seconds. Fujita's work revealed patterns no one had recognized. Families of tornadoes spawned by a single supercell, subtle differences in wind damage, and the hidden force of downbursts. His methods, rigorous and sometimes controversial, set a new standard for scientific investigation. The Fujita scale, adopted nationwide, gave meteorologists a common language to rate tornado intensity by the scars left behind. With this framework, scientists could finally compare storms, understand their power, and target public safety efforts where they mattered most. The practical results were immediate and profound. Warning lead times, once stuck at five minutes or less, more than doubled within a generation. False alarms, which had plagued communities with unnecessary panic, dropped sharply as forecasters learned to distinguish real threats from false signals. Fujita's legacy endures every time a siren sounds with enough time for families to reach shelter. The trust between the public and the warning system, earned through hard science and relentless fieldwork, became one of the super outbreak's most lasting victories. In just 24 hours, the 1974 super outbreak unleashed 148 tornadoes across 13 states, leaving 335 dead and over 6,000 injured. Communities like Xenia, Brandenburg, and Tanner faced destruction on a scale rarely seen, while relief efforts mobilized 7,500 National Guard troops and countless volunteers. The disaster exposed critical flaws in radar and warning systems, leading to a $4.5 billion investment in NEXRAD Doppler radar, the expansion of NOAA weather radio from 66 to over 330 stations, and a near tripling of tornado warning lead times from 5 to 13 minutes. Yet, the reasons some tornadoes took such unpredictable paths remain under scientific study. Today, Tornado fatality rates have dropped by 70%, and every siren and warning traces its lineage to lessons learned in 1974. The records and survivor testimonies show that when nature's fury struck, communities rebuilt and science advanced. The endurance of the human spirit remains the most lasting legacy of the super outbreak.